Hi, everybody, and welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, UTSA's neuroscience research podcast. Today is February 8th, 2024, and we're talking to Josh Nunebell. Josh is an associate professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the University of Delaware. And his, bra- his lab works on social interactions, mostly in mice, and brain mechanisms that are in play during those interactions, and this has led him into the study of vocal communication in mice that are interacting socially with each other in a way that their vocalizations get worked and into their society. Uh, hi, Josh. Hello. Glad to be here. Uh, also with us today are some familiar faces, Alfonso Lampicella, our local cortical auditory system circuit guy. Hello. And Nicole Licha, our human speech and communications expert. Hello. And Francesco Savelli, who studies the campus and spatial <laughs> cognition. Hello. Is that fair? Yeah, it's fair. And it may not sound like it's related, but it is. It yeah, is. sounds yeah. like it. Yeah. And uh, I, hope, I hope that will happen. I hope we'll end up talking about that. And I'm your host, Charlie Wilson. So we have a nice crowd here today, and I've altered our sound recording setup a little bit, and I hope the sound works out okay. It's kind of an experiment. Because I don't have enough lapel marks. Josh did it bring it. Yeah, that's I'm sorry. <laughs> I use a Zoom H, uh, eight, uh, H6. and Anyway, some of you may know what that means. So, um, Josh, there are a lot of things to talk about, but I, and I don't want to rule anything out, but I want to start with a sort of hobby interest of mine, which is code breaking. And it seems to me that you're learning the language of the mouse. You're basically breaking its code and you've collected a bunch of sounds that the mice make when they're interacting with each other. There's discrete sounds that are like signals, <laughs> let's call them, instead of words. <laughs> and then uh, the animals are doing social behaviors, and there's some discrete ones of those, like chasing each other or fighting or running around in circles. And then you can watch the mice, and you have figured out a clever way to figure out which mouse is making which sound, which, which is harder than think <laughs> and then and so now you can see uh, if there's a relationship between the sounds and the behaviors and the sounds are part of the social behavior the sounds are associated with the behaviors not with the individual mice so you can't tell which mouse is which by listening to the sounds that would be nice if you could kind of and then the sounds are um, uh, the mice that are engaging in this behavior are affected by the sounds but the mice that are nearby, but not engaging in the behavior, are not, as if they know he's not talking to me. <laughs> and then uh, this makes it seem like the mice are actually saying something and reacting. They don't have a conversation back and forth, but they're still saying something. And I'm a little surprised that mice would have a language like that. So what do you think? Do they really have? So... I would be, first of all, I'd be careful with how I describe this. I wouldn't necessarily call it a language, per se. Uh, That's, again, I feel people that are experts in studying human language might be insulted if they think that, oh, mice are speaking the way we do. It's a much more uh, rudimentary, simple form of communication, is what I would call it. I mean, these are vocalizations specific types of vocalizations that may convey meaning and have some sort of meaning to them that does tend to be associated with behavior. But language is, uh, I have to say, it makes me a little uncomfortable to say language uh, with mice. Uh, yeah. All right, so disclaimer is officially registered, and anybody who might be offended by anything else that happens today <laughs> should know that we've already said that. <laughs> but it, it, it's a little bit like a bunch of kids playing a game, and one of them says, you're it. Uh, I mean, they're not having a conversation, but that, but that is a human uh, version of something like that, is it not? It would. I would definitely. I would say it's communication, uh, for sure. I mean, you are indicating. They're indicating. <laughs> tag you're it. Go do your behavior. So in that sense, yes, there are parallels. But 
and again, you probably others could probably chime in about the human language aspect. We have syntax and orders of magnitude more complexity to human language that and that allows us to sort of exchange words and put them together in ways that convey even more information. Do I expect to see something like this in mice? I don't think I would be able to see something like that. So again, it sort of depends on... So to, to rescue you a little bit here, for <laughs> the, I mean, there, it's true that language in and of itself is, is a symbolic representation of meaning, right? So we have different languages because there's different symbolic representations and we can have a, a auditory representation, we can have a signed representation, we can have a written representation. Those are all just symbolic representations of the meaning. And that, that part, I don't think anybody would say the mice have that aspect of it. Uh, but on the flip side, language didn't come out of nowhere. And so there's precursors in other species. And so I'm really interested in, in what you've observed in these animals, not because I think it's the complexity of human language, but because there seems to be something very much into the decoding of like this, the same way that we humans have grunts, you know, like uh, that are meaningful. Um, they're, they're forms of communication too. Um, but it, it seems to me like it's a cool precursor at a, at a cognitive level. Like they're making sense of these sounds in some way that is meaningful. And, and that is to me a little bit a hint of language in that, in that sense. Is that, is that interesting? Yeah, so I would, I mean, there, I would say there's definitely information being conveyed in these students. And, <laughs> and again, I... So mouse, one mouse listens to the other mouse and knows what that meaning is. That's the, that's the, that's the question. That is that the question. That really has to be resolved. It, yeah. I'm not expecting a final answer to it. It's just that, but I'm interested in the, in the method. So I kind of like to go... A little bit into what you actually measure. So, one of the ways that we can see the different sounds is just by making spectrograms of it. And there's a lot in that. You can learn a lot just by looking at that. Like, what is it that makes one sound different from another? What's present and what's absent in those sounds compared to uh, other kinds of sounds like a bird song or a human speech or something like that? So would you say something about how you measure the sound and what it, what you see in it? Okay, so when we are, we use these specialized microphones that are incredibly sensitive and that are allow us to pick up these ultrasonic sounds. And these are incredibly high frequency sounds that's gonna cause this, this microphone uh, membrane to sort of vibrate at very fast paces. And so basically what we're looking at is just sound waves, essentially. It's a sound it's a wave. Frequency. Yeah, it's a very high frequency sound. So our microphones probably wouldn't even pick it up. You No, we have to go buy very, very expensive ones from other <laughs> companies to, to pick these up. And so a, they're specialized... Uh, uh, sound detection devices. They they sense the sort of the changes in pressure, essentially. And uh, um, it's a if you look back at the older literature, people would use like bat detectors, and they sort of tune these things to very very specific frequencies, and say, "Oh, look, I'm picking up these ultrasonic sounds in this little frequency band." If you wanted to pick up more, a different one, you'd have to tune it a little bit different to change the frequency. So people have known about ultrasonic vocalization since I would say it's probably the 50s or so. They started recording these and looking at ultrasound. The problem, though, is these are sounds that are emitted during social behaviors. And so we really need a way to sort of pinpoint who's vocalizing when. And so one microphone isn't enough to actually do this. And so um, that's where my lab came in and said, okay, let's try to, let's try to solve this problem. It's, a, it's, it's something that's important. And so, so we use multiple microphones that are very sensitive to these high frequency sounds, picking up sounds at different times. And then we use the timing differences to say, oh, this is where it's coming from, essentially. So you can figure out which sound is coming from which mouse. Yes, exactly. 
So we've tried to duplicate. I, yeah, and I think it's working well. And we're socializing. Yeah, yeah. and socializing. <laughs> we're not moving, but yeah. The so what you see in the spectrograms are our little wiggly changes in frequency. So it looked like when I was looking at it, it looked like it wasn't a harmonic stack like a bird song would have in it. It's a, it is a sort of a, almost a pure wave that's modulated in frequency. Yeah. Is that so uh, uh, that's so the data that we've been focusing on, yes, that's what we're looking at. But it doesn't mean that mice don't produce these sounds with harmonics. They they do, but again, we we took the simplistic approach and we wanted to start simple. I mean, we eventually want to build in harmonics and try to understand does that add even more information. Is that why you went and looked at the ultrasonic? range and and ignored those things that we could actually hear uh, well or, that's one of the reasons uh but again with with ultrasound we can't localize that with our own ears we don't know but like right now we're talking we don't need the mics to say oh it's josh talking right now you can tell it's because it's an audible sound you we all do sound source localization and process <laughs> this and know where the sound's coming from so audible People have been able to track who's making these audible calls easier. Ultrasonic, no, there's been really no clue who. Uh, there's been assumptions, a lot of assumptions made, but it's always like the male mouse that produces these calls. But, um, and these assumptions were based on, like, if you anesthetize a female mouse and put a male mouse in there, he'll run around and he'll, he'll you, there'll be vocalizations. You anesthetize the male, but put the female in, there won't be vocalizations. But if you took two females together, what do you think is going to happen? They vocalize. So that would tell me that in these social settings, when they can move around and do things, maybe they're vocalizing. So to start out, we don't even know all the different circumstances in which the mice will make these vocalizations because they're ultrasonic and we can't hear them. Yeah, that's, we are trying, essentially we are trying to write a dictionary for what yeah. these sounds mean using behavior as the definition. There's your code. That's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, we're a perfect transition. <laughs> so, so when I'm looking at that spectrogram and you're pointing out this sound is different from this one, it will be something like, this one starts kind of low and it's kind of high. This one starts kind of high and it's kind of low. This one goes low, high, low, and high, low, high. And there, you can sort of see them as these just little wiggles in this spectrogram. And they stand out. You can tell them apart pretty easily. You did just eyeball them. You figured them out. We uh, use mathematics to uh, tell us that these are different. Yeah. But, uh, and, but yeah, people have been, and again, it, it, Every lab has sort of a different definition of this is a category of vocalization. Uh, they, uh, that's something that I think we, as a field, really need to sort of standardize. We need to come together and say, this is what one type is. This is sort of the range of different types of signals there are. Um, and I think that there's a lot of really good labs out there that are really trying to sort of push this to try to say, look, that, What's how much diversity do we have? What do we want to call vocalizations? And so we just came up with another way of doing it, essentially. So the, the first part of this whole task is to make a, I, I don't want to say complete, but as complete as possible, a list of all the vocalizations that are related to social behavior. Because most may have vocalizations that have nothing to do with social behavior. They, yeah, they could. I mean, you, and again, if you look at these sort of audible squeaks, they squeak audibly in response to pain. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so there's so, all sorts of different sort so of... Crying out is not communication, necessarily. I mean, I guess if you think somebody could be hearing you, it is. But if it's just a scream in pain, it's not part of the mouse language. Oh, I don't know. I know when my kids cried. I, I, I. That's that's. Can you respond? I respond, I respond very quickly to that. Do, do, do baby mice do that to attract their parents? Uh, yes, there have been a lot of studies showing that mice that fall out of their nest, uh, they start producing the ultrasonic signals, and mom runs over there, grabs them, and brings them back to the safety of the nest where they're warm. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so even crying out is a 
And what does that sigma look like? It's not as simple as the ones that that's it's, happening when I chase you or... Um, well, there are differences between them. They're still ultrasonic, uh, and they're still, um, I've got a student in the lab that's actually trying to characterize up vocalizations and adult vocalizations through the, the lifetime of an individual. And, um, and like these, the pup calls, they tend to be shorter in duration, uh, the, the pace, the timing between vocalizations is shorter. Um, and so there are, uh, there are dif they are distinctly different than the ultrasonic vocalizations produced by adults. So there is changes over time. But again, if you think about this too, animals are growing. They're changing. Mm -hmm. the, the structure for producing these is elongating and, and changing. Physically. So, but they're physically. also changing in their experiences in the world. They are. So there's a, a lot that ties into sort of what do these mean and... Uh, so, and, I, sorry, go ahead. And follow up on Nicole's question. Right now you saw that animals, they are socially interacting, vocalized, and they're not able to recruit you know, other animals. Do you think that this is a de developmental issue? or, you know, not issue, uh, process, you know, when they're young, I always, you know, sorry if I bring once again a human point of view, but you see kids, you know, crying at, uh, you know, yelling at the party, and then all they start to yell together, get involved in the, in the behavior. Have you seen situations like that, or do you think there are any contexts that are going to lead to this type of more social interaction? That is a great question that I wish I had a good answer to, but I'm going to speculate and give you this. Um, so when I, I like, so when we were showing that certain calls produce beha ch behavioral changes in animals that are socially engaged, but not the sort of bystanders, we were not, we didn't produce an exhaustive uh, behavioral response to this. We we studied simple metrics to say this is what a change is. Change it, th things that were easy to, to quantify, basically. The changes we saw were like changes in speed. This is easy, easy to measure. But there could be so many other more nuanced changes. Maybe they're changing their orientation and looking towards it. Maybe they're doing other things that we didn't actually we haven't gotten a chance to go in and quantify yet. So maybe when they are producing these calls, they might not be directed towards a specific individual, but it, I don't know if I would comfortably say that they are being completely ignored and not affecting completely the behavior of others. Maybe they're doing little things or telling them to stay away. I don't want to be, there's a chase going on. This, this is kind of, uh, this is an event that you probably don't want to be part of. So I don't know necessarily if, I don't see anything that says they, they run over to help protect them. But So the, the I guess the question, because I had the same thought was, as you were, you were thinking the same thing as you was talking. Um, the question is, do, do they develop the repertoire? Mm. Or do they, because it's a so, social yeah. interaction. All right, so I don't think, all right, so I don't think there's a lot of evidence to say these, they're not learned. But in terms of learning and developing these and creating an association between what they're doing and the type of call, that is, you're talking about my next R1, basically. And uh, <laughs> that's, so... There's really, like, we have this data that says, look, as adults, there's this association. You, they, they start producing these calls during these behaviors. Um, then they're, this is, they're eight weeks old at this point. They've had a lot of experiences. They've, they've gone through different uh, life as a mouse. And, but there's been other studies that say, okay, let's record the vocation, uh, vocalizations of, as a pub. I'll look to see how they're sort of behaving. What are they doing? But they haven't seen this sort of pattern of certain calls associated with behavior. So early on, it's missing. We don't see that. Maybe over time they develop, maybe they learn to make these associations, but I don't know. In light of that, what yeah. is going to happen if you isolate one of these animals and then you take in one of these environments? We are isolated. 
you need to ask the lark, a special room where the animal is going to stay by itself. You know, what is going to happen? So, because you're saying that these are processes, these are make... experiments right out of the bird sound literature. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> do they learn it in isolation? Does the juvenile, yeah, yeah. learn their song? Basically? Yeah, yeah. So, mice, uh, uh, the field does not uh, think these are mini songbirds, uh, they don't learn vocalization, how to produce these. You can deafen the animal, it's going to vocalize. Uh, you can uh, you can remove the cortex. The animal is going to vocalize forever, um, because the human, I, that's, humans that's also a, that it Forever is not well, been looked at yet. <laughs> for a long time. For, what I'm yeah. saying is, yeah. humans yeah. also yeah. like infant yeah. children babble even if they're deaf. Yeah. yeah, but then they stop babbling because there's no learning yeah. happening. There's no effect of uh, they don't, they can't hear themselves. So. That is unknown right now. I, they, most of the experiments they do is they test them. They 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 deafen. They uh, do something uh, conditional knockout, remove the ability to hear. hear. That will last an extended period of time, and then they test them again once when they're old and say, "Look, making the same types of calls at eight weeks old." Um, so that's whether or not. It happened. If again, I, I think it'd be cool. Maybe we can recruit somebody to do this. But look at this every day from day fifteen on to say what's happening. What do these sounds look like? Do we see the variation? We see variation in the way they vocalize over time, just uh, within an individual. But I don't have an answer for it. Yet. So there's a possibility they don't learn to make those sounds. But they learn to make those sounds in a particular yes, place. yeah, that, that's yeah, and so that is something that I'm interested in. Do they like? I think no matter what happens, if they do learn how to make uh, to associate this sound with this behavior, that's an awesome finding. Even if they don't, that is still something that's going to be informative. So I'm tailoring my gamut to that title. So since we're talking about learning, we should be talking about campus a little bit because uh, <laughs> because I know you're. A hippocampus guy, and you worked on the hippocampus, and the, and these are animals are running around in a spatial environment, interacting with each other in a spatial way, and it seems likely that uh, learning of, of the when and how to make these sounds could be connected to to that. Is it? Do you think? Oh, <laughs> uh, asking you to speculate, but you are hippocampus. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Hippocampus. Yes. Speculate a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to chime in, Francesca? First <laughs> So, in terms of the learning process, I, I that is that's a that's a hard question to answer right now. I I think first and foremost. I need to know whether or not, like, what's what's being represented. Uh, how I need to understand the basics first. Here's 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 an experience the animal's going through. How is that experience being represented in the hippocampus? It's the, it, the hippocampus is tied to episodic memory and remembering experiences. One would I would assume that the hippocampus is encoding this information in this experience because it, that's that's it. That's what the structure's been associated with. So, I would say first of all, we need to just again look at these behaviors, look at animals freely interacting, which we're we're doing, and look at how they're responding to these different sensory cues. Can I can I rephrase the question slightly? Yes, or make it more narrow. Um, <laughs> what's I'm, because I'm not a hippocampus person. I, I was curious when you're talking about it. I don't know. Uh, what happens to since people haven't looked at interacting socially interacting animals? Uh, you said you have said um, while they're learning or in, in engaging in environment, these place cell maps that you people have recorded with a single mouse running around or a rat running around in in a space. How quickly do they remap to changes in the environment? So if if I change from a room-centered mapping to an object-centered mapping, so now my point of interest is the animal next to me, does my spatial map now reorient to that mouse uh, that I'm chasing? 
So it can be quick. Yeah, it's pretty quick. Um, Context-wise, you know, they even um, document and things like flickering between the two representation at a very, very fast time scale, mm -hmm. like with virtual um, environments where you can just change context. From egocentric, allocentric, also, um, you know, there are studies that, you know, that this representation can change pretty quickly. Now, for social interaction, there is like just recent studies. So there's, you know, there maybe there's less information about that, but uh, yeah, it's quick, it can be quick. So this, I was just wondering if like, if you're watching, if you put the mouse in by itself and you develop, you figure out what its map is and then add another mouse, uh, does that map completely reorient to the animal um, socially? Something like that, there really changes. There's kind of studying it in bots now, uh -huh. even more than, so, Ranowski and um, 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 Yertsev, um, you know, laboratories, you know, they're, they're just doing this kind of questions in bats. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether, you know, they really have like that kind of lots where, mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's kind of. But if you consider the new mouse like a new object, correct, there has been, I think, experiment in hippocampus when you reach the environment with the new object. Object, I think, yeah, even so though the moves you think is other cortex, and yeah, so yeah, with objects, but the objects are different from a cost specific, yeah, okay. individual, of course. So, who's moving around? Who's moving around? Yes, changing position. Moving up. But can I ask you a question about um, the neural basis of all this that is not doing hippocampus? And so, I think it's a perfect question to ask to you two together. So you show that there is this pitch going up or going down, and roughly I think it relates to being more aggressive or less aggressive. It was like something like that. Yeah. Right? So supposedly, when you get that, you get a different reaction, potentially engaging in completely different neural pathways, right? How could that be organized in the brain? Because I'm thinking, you know, the closest thing I can think, maybe there are projections that are tonotopically organized. And this is not tonotropic. This is actually way more complex because it could be, it's a relative thing. Does it go up? Does it go down? Is that, does anybody know, you know, like so, what it, because you do, you do tonotropic also some, you know, studies. You yeah, know, but you're more expert than me about that. But neurons in the auditory system, they are not only tuned to tones, correct? It's very famous to be tuned to frequency modulation sound, you know, the upward and the downward. It looks okay. like that is exactly what Josh is saying. And so that yeah. could be like the way that no, we need that to think about it. engages different reactions to. So um, Marina's work was uh, shows this at even earlier. Speaking of pathways, um, mm -hmm. the inferior colliculus seems to have yeah. different neurons that respond to upward sweeps or downward sweeps. Mm -hmm. So there's different neurons, presumably communicating with different neurons in cortex. Um, so already there, there seems to be some dissociation. Uh, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I was kind of trying to, uh, I was kind of thinking on my feet about supposedly these two very small differences might kind of stimulate, say, I don't know, the amygdala versus something completely different, you know, like coming from probably the same origin mm -hmm. of the brain. So how could that be organized? You know, that's kind of like was my the question I had. These really simple frequency shifts seem ideal for engaging lots of the auditory systems. Seems like that. For example. That's one of the things the auditory system is really paying attention to. And these are, uh, and they and they are relative. So uh, you, di you didn't say anything about it, but the, the, the thing that makes one of these vocalizations different from the other is the frequency profile in time. It's not how loud it is, or what frequency it is exactly centered on, or any of that stuff. And so two mice can be differently loud and say the same thing, and it, it would be the same thing. One yeah. could have a high voice, and one could have a low voice, and it would all be fine. And in that way, it's like human speech sounds, which are also that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, the amplitude variant, the meaning is amplitude. Yeah, it definitely, again, from the way we were looking at it, what we saw, the change in pitch is what really is, jumps out at us. Um, and 
again, we're not the sort of first people in the world to sort of think about this, but uh, there's been older studies where they're like, changes in these pitches, and, and again, in different species of animals, are associated with sort of like a motivational, emotional component to it. And that sort of, again, that I see this sort of parallels very beautifully with the behavior. Look, we're, these animals are engaged in different behavior. This is a, a high arousal situation. I'm, I'm being chased. This guy wants to attack me. Uh, it's very emotionally arousing. And, and uh, so, and again, it sort of parallels what people have seen in other, other, other species and other animals too. So it's, there is some sort of universal, universal sort of communication pattern that I think we're, we're seeing. So uh, I, can't, I can't sort of let you get away without talking about the categorization of behavior. Because the whole key to this match between the sounds and the behavior is to have a fine resolution of the different sounds that the animals make. And to just know how many there are, how many different vocalizations there are in the repertoire of the animal. And then how many different kinds of behaviors there are. And we normally think of behavior as being sort of open-ended, but the mice are doing pretty much the same things over and over and over again. But, the, but what they're doing in your arena is not completely exhausting the entire range of mouse behavior or the, maybe the entire range of mouse vocalizations. So that would be a match. I mean, as, a, as it is, it looks like you've got like 20 sounds and six behaviors. Uh, seems like more sounds than you need. So we were, yeah, so we were, um, when we did this, we wanted to, I guess, we didn't know if there was going to be, if a, if a certain sound with a certain pitch was going to be different than a sound with maybe a lower pitch and change in frequency. We didn't know if there were differences. And then if you, so we do have like 22 different types of vocalizations, but they, there's very, there's subtle differences in terms of how their pitch changes. You could probably break that down to a more simple scheme saying, look, there is vocalizations that increase in pitch, there's vocalizations that decrease in pitch. And then you might have a more clear mapping onto the behavior. Yeah, but Josh, yeah. we are defining, you know, uh, ultrasonic from 20 kilohertz to 120 kilohertz. What is the richest content in frequency in these uh, ultrasonic vocalization? Because they have, as Charlie was suggesting, you know, we ha they have a, a broad spectrum of frequency they can use. Which one they use? So the ones they use most frequently, again, they, they, they do cover the entire range. Okay. But the, the it's around 60 to 80 kilohertz that has the highest, uh, uh, most common frequency, I would say. So there is a band that most of these signals are actually follow, falling in, but there are some that are higher. It's, it's a distribution. By finding the, the boundaries between the sounds that matter and behavior, you find the, the important thing about the sound. So if, there, if these six sounds, which are sort of different from each other, all are associated with exactly the same behavior, mean exactly the same thing, then they are the same thing. But the, that's the category of, we, last week we were talking about categorical mm -hmm. perception. That's the category of sounds that are called that in the mouse's imagination. And so you can end up discovering the boundaries between the sounds by comparing them to behavior if you have a fine enough resolution of behavior. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, that is also something we are trying to push forward with, too. Like we, uh, we, it, we do a good job of ex automatically extracting behavior using uh, machine learning approaches to supervise machine learning approaches to pull this out. So we get a lot of behavior, but by no means do we get everything. And so we are missing a lot of stuff. Uh, which again, my dream is to get everything. Maybe I'm greedy, but mm -hmm. I want everything so we can go in and actually have more behaviors and have a better characterization. Yeah, you definitely wouldn't want to have a moment when 
there's a vocalization, but there's no identified behavior. That that's just a gap. Yeah. I don't know what was happening during that time. I might. Yeah. Well, they were just yeah. chatting. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, they were philosophers. Yeah. I, I would also say no. behavior is continuous. It's not going to just stop. I mean, you transition into something else. You're doing something else. It is a ongoing process that lasts forever until the animal passes away. But, um, yeah, that's what I was about to ask. Is there, is there any history dependence in this regard? Right now, you just match organization to kind of discrete behavior. And, you know, but maybe the sequence of behaviors of the history of what happened influence the vocalization to some extent? That is another dream question that I want to answer someday. Uh, we, we are not at the point right now where we can answer that because we are missing too many behaviors. We don't have continuous identification of behavior. So if there is, like you alluded to, one that you sort of see a certain sequence of vocalizations, does that precede a behavior? A certain sequences of behaviors, what is the sort of patterning? I want that, but we do not have, uh, we don't have, right now, we haven't labeled every single behavior that these mice are so, doing. So coming back to what Charlie just said about, you know, having a noise without a behavior, there are other species of mice that are much chattier that don't necessarily, they're not necessarily doing anything while they're chatting that we can observe. So what do you think, I mean, when you, I know maybe that's in your next, your that ten tenth hour one down the down the road. <laughs> how do you decode that? Yeah. How, how do you, how do you figure out what they what those mean? I, that's the sort of one that where they did step when they talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it makes it a little bit easier to write the dictionary. <laughs> yeah. And Michael Long was here recently, correct? There is also this other type of mouse. What is the singing mouse? Listen, listen, listening or singing? Singing yeah. mouse, correct. Yeah. What do you think would we be the repertoire of vocalization that are different of our mus musculus mouse that we use on a daily so, basis? A lot? So they have some absolutely beautiful studies where they produce these, it's sort of like a, a back and forth calling and, and those tend to be more in the uh, audible range you can hear them they ramp up beautiful 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 but they also produce ultrasonic vocalizations and so they have a wide range of uh, uh, communication signals that they can use and so um it's an open question. I, make it, I'm making them with a single vocal apparatus, though, so they couldn't be having two conversations at the same time. The way a dolphin does. Yeah. 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 So uh, well, it's like back and forth. One vocalizes, here's the next one. And they couldn't be talking in this in both in, ranges. Oh yeah, no, yeah. There, there, it doesn't occur simultaneously. It, 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 uh, it, there's different states, behavioral states that they think are associated with them. Similar to the bat. Yeah. 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 So, so it's um, so it's a good question. I, I again, they have a voc uh, ultrasonic vocal repertoire. I don't think that one is. I, I mean, I, I've talked to Michael before in the past, and they're like, "Oh, I'd like to characterize this. I want to know what's going on." And some of his higher students. So, it would be incredibly great to learn the language of them. I think they have something to say. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for joining us, Josh and Nicole and Alfonso and Francesco. That was great. Thanks, Charlie. Yep. Thank, thank you. And this has been the Rosanna Talk Shop.